Hi everyone, Anna from girlsonkey.com. We serve up poetry content for you guys. Today's Poet Spotlight is Hera Lindsay Bird. I had the chance to interview her when I was in Wellington last year, so this is an excerpt from the interview. Hey everyone, so today's Poet Spotlight is Hera Lindsay Bird, who I was lucky enough to interview in Wellington last year. So this is a little bit about Hera. So Hera Lindsay Bird was born in Thames in New Zealand. She went to Victoria University of Wellington, where she received her MA in Poetry from the International Institute of Modern Letters. Her first collection of poetry, the self-titled Hera Lindsay Bird, was published by Victoria University Press in 2016, and she won the Jessie Mackay Best First Book Award at the Ockham New Zealand Book Awards. She also won the 2011 Adam Prize for Best Folio. So here's an excerpt from the interview I did with Hera when I was in Wellington. Hello, I'm here in Wellington in Te Aro, is that right? Yeah. With Hera Lindsay Bird, and I'm sitting in a lovely window seat overlooking the ah hill uh, there. some kind of uh, <laughs> some kind of hill, I believe. Yeah, <laughs> lots of beautiful, <laughs> lots of beautiful trees, having a nice glass of red wine, and yeah, we're just gonna have a bit of a chat about things about poetry. Mm. So we were just talking earlier before we came onto this recording about interviews and questions that you always get asked. Is there a question that you're just like, just don't ask me that I'm over it. Like, I just don't want to talk about that anymore. I think, well, people ask me a lot about sex in my writing. Like, that's the thing that I get the most. Yeah. And I kind of, that's, it's always a little bit confusing to me because I know there is some sexually explicit stuff in my book, but to me the book isn't really actually that raunchy at all. Like, if you've read any 20th century <laughs> poetry, it's pretty tame. Yeah. <laughs> and also most of the sex is a joke. You know, like, it's like a, a punchline. Yeah. So it's kind of strange to me that I have to talk about that all the time, but mm. that's, I suppose, that's... Because I know people sort of talk about that whole girls phenomenon, the whole anti-hero. We were talking about that show Fleabag earlier, mm. about having this kind of women being out there about about sexual experiences, basically. Like, where do you see yourself fitting into that whole kind of... Not, it's not really a genre, but it's sort of a trend, I guess. Um, I feel like I, it's not it's not a genre that I hate or anything, but I do feel really removed from it because, like, if I mention sex in one of my poems, it's not like, I'm going to tell you about the time I, like, fucked a day and I had a terrible <laughs> yeast infection and, like... I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how the rest of the story goes. Yeah, that whole kind of explicit... Yeah, it's kind of like... of that kind of thing, or...? It's just that, it's just that, like, as I said, like, when I use sex in my poems, it's the dirty jokes, basically. Like, they're, like most of the sex references are kind of, like, just kind of weird one-liners, and they, and that's not actually, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not really drawing on my, like, real-life sexual experiences for mm. those parts of the book. I, was, I don't think it's confessional in that way, not in the same right. way that, like... Yeah, and, and um, you mentioned earlier today that, so your nana is not allowed to read your... <laughs> Your book. Yeah. So is, is your family sort of more conservative on that way? or No, my family's not conservative at but, all. Yeah. My mum and dad are really cool and they I went to visit my mum kind of a couple of months ago and I thought I'll have a nice chill weekend and I hang out with my mum and it will be I won't have to do any book stuff and she said I've organised a reading for you. <laughs> um, so they're, they're, yeah, they're really stoked and they're really mm. cool about that kind of stuff. It's just my grandmother and it's just a generational thing I think. Mm. In New Zealand your book is a bestseller mm. and so how does that as a poet to be a best-selling book is really it's a big deal yeah it's really cool when I when I think about it you forget so quickly because it has so little kind of bearing on my day-to-day -day life other than mm. I have to like answer a lot more emails than I used to I kind of forget that it's like a thing a thing <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and I mean you work at a bookshop and so tell me about that experiences have you had experiences with crazed fans or anything or getting people wanting to find the book and uh, I the 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 weirdest thing that ever happened to me was like this guy who would kind of leave me gifts at my work, and I <laughs> would, had like blocked him already on a couple of other sites, and yeah, um, but he would just kind of come and leave things for me on the desk. Like and that what was about kind like of thing? Creepy. Well, the first one was a cake, <laughs> and it came with a like beautiful a whole card, cake. a whole a full chocolate cake. Wow. Well, I was away, so I didn't, wow. I wasn't even there for it. Yeah, but it said sorry for the inappropriate messages on <laughs> the, the card on the cake, and then um, he left me like a an ear piercing voucher on Christmas Eve and then I had to get in touch with him and be like look I'm sorry but this is not appropriate. Have you used the piercing voucher yet? 
I gave it to someone else. I'm not. I'm not having a weird stranger pierce my ears for me. <laughs> well, so I don't want pierced ears. Yeah. You know. So you don't have pierced ears at all. No. no. Any tats? Oh, you got you got that little one. Got my. I've got this what, thing on my arm. <laughs> this sounds so fucking wanky. It's from a, a really funny kind of 1920s surrealist fantasy book called Muslim, which is like what? based on this guy. Um, who's collaborated with an illustrator and mushroom is like what his daughter used to call mushrooms. So they kind of made this oh. like funny surrealist world. Yeah, so I've got, I, this is just like the flag that they have in that world, which means um, night or something. I don't know. I think that's probably the most interesting tattoo story that I've ever heard. <laughs> no, it's about like, I, I kind <laughs> I of really like it because it's, it's so shit. Like if you, I mean, I know that anyone listening now can't actually see the tattoo, but um. When I actually got it done, my friend did it, and um, I got it done with my ex, who also got a tattoo done, and they had theirs put on Instagram, and my tattoo artist was like, do you mind if I don't put this on the internet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, because, because... Oh, yeah, just because it's like a shitty drawing, and it looks like the tattoo artist did it really badly, but actually she's very talented, I just wanted this kind of horrible, crappy thing. Oh, it comes straight from the book. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's just photocopied and pasted straight onto my arm, basically. Yeah. So you are a book geek, obviously. There's a bit of book geekness going on. Ah, uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I try not to be too fanatic about it, because there's nothing more insufferable than a book geek. Yeah. I mean, well, you know. in the shop, it probably, you know, it's good to have that knowledge, I guess. It is good, yeah. yeah. I mean, I do get a bit sick of people coming into the bookstore all this time and kind of being like, there's nothing like the smell of a good book. <laughs> you know, I kind of, like, I'm not, I'm not cultish in that way. Like, I like books because... I think that like writing is exciting and stimulating and yeah, yeah the yeah, culture of a book is kind of a sniff, bit yeah sniff them not a book sniffer no. I have a my I treat my books really badly my books are all covered in like various sauces and gravies and I turn I turn the pages and I throw them across the room because by the you know they need to be red and some people would take issue with that but oh yeah no I know <laughs> you know. <laughs> And so it's like a really precious edition. I'm, yeah. I'm careful with it, but. And so on your on your bedside table, what books are you reading at the moment? Oh, I've got a million things. I'm actually reading. Um, I work at a bookshop, so it's kind of, you know, it's easy to collect a lot of books very quickly. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I'm reading uh, Mark Twain, which is kind of really? kind of it's like a weird thing. I actually got George Saunders as my favourite writer, and I love him, and I love all. My favourite literary fiction is always comedy based, like either poetry or fiction. Um, mm. And so he kind of did this list of like his 10 favourite comedy books of all time. And um, Mark Twain was on there and Mark Kurt Twain Vonnegut. Mark Twain in comedy. Mark Twain, yeah. He's, oh, I he's kind of associate that with comedy. Um, yeah, well, I, the, I kind of didn't either because it's one of those names that's so ubiquitous that he just kind of like merges them with like, you know, you're like, oh, Gore Vidal, Tolstoy, Mark Twain, all of yeah. those like old dead people who I don't know what they were writing about. But he's actually incredibly, incredibly funny. Really? And like, you know, everywhere in the States kind of builds him as a humorist. I just think that because we don't have him in schools so much over here, kind of, mm. maybe. And I do you find, because there's a bit of talk about his racism, do you find that that comes through or not? Really? I, I have to say, I actually haven't yes. heard that before. Mm. Yeah, that, there's that whole kind of colonial and all that kind of racist stuff. I don't oh, know. I'm sure there is. I'm reading his autobiographical writing at the moment and I've just started Tom Sawyer. Mm. Um, and I have to say I'm a little bit... when you were a child? No, you need yeah. to... Oh. No. So I have, I kind of don't don't really know what I'm in for. Well, that's kind of cool coming to it as an adult because a lot of people read, get, had to read it, you know, when they were a child at school or whatever. And maybe I'm showing my age. Mm. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but also the non-fiction side, I guess, you know, you always think of his fiction but not of his non-fiction. So... Yeah, yeah, he has a lot of kind of weird mm. essays, and he's got some kind of quite famous ones because he lost his um, wife and his daughter within about a year of each other. I think when his daughter was like, I can't remember how old she was, maybe twenty or something. Okay. But he's kind of got these weird, weird kind of like grief essays as well. Mm. And and you know when you're talking about comedy writing and, and humour, because I do I find a lot of your work funny, you know. And it's about <laughs> sometimes at readings, some people might not be sure you know is it to do with the delivery do you think or that because I know sometimes your delivery is quite dry and then it's do you that see your work as being t- like quite comedic or I try to put as many jokes in as humanly possible <laughs> yeah I don't know like it's kind of my it's I don't know if it's everyone's sense of humor mm. but because there's definitely some laugh out loud moments when I first read your book like and I don't I don't have that very often we actually just like cackle yeah, yeah. <laughs> be on the train and 
Oh. Yeah, I kind of, you know, like I'm not going for the laugh every time, like I think that, but I do, that's just the kind of writing that I'm interested in, mm. it's kind of mainly. The, the, the people who I love the most as poets are, there were two poets, there's Chelsea Minnis um, and Mark Leidner, who both, like I wouldn't have written the book that I did without having read both of their books first, like I've stolen a lot from them. And they kind of both have this kind of really strikingly kind of funny, absurd comedy, but it's also, you know, there's there's definitely like emotion and narrative behind it. Mm. I don't think you can do one without the other, really. And and, you know, when you were studying at Vic, did you have to push against the grain a bit to write what you wanted to write? Did you find it's like, what's it like having to study creative writing and wanting to do, you know, write the way that you want to write? Is it Was it a struggle? or? Well, I was really <laughs> lucky. Not that I think any other year would have been different, but I had a, um, the year that I went, I had a teacher called Bernadette Hall who was kind of looking after the creative writing program for a year. And she just has the best sense of humour. And every time I was like, I don't know if I can say blowjob in a poem, Bernie, <laughs> she'd, she'd be like, no, you have to do it, do it, do it. So <laughs> she, she was like, she actually really helped me kind of push the boundaries a little bit more That's I think cool. yeah yeah because uh, yeah I think boundary pushing is an interesting thing isn't it saying you know about people see it as being quite your work as being quite provocative but you don't really you don't really see it that way or no there's a couple um, of lines in there in that I was poetry, like you know pushing those boundaries and I just think I I grew up <laughs> reading contemporary American poetry and so <laughs> I grew up with like or or even um kind of European poetry so like my favorites were always the surrealists and I love the New York school and all of those people were so like bawdy and funny and full mm. of life and so mm. to me when I read when I kind of write stuff it doesn't seem like shocking on any level but I suppose that the poetry that most people in New Zealand have grown up with is this kind of apart from Robert Creeley we have a kind of a our tradition is a wee bit more British maybe yeah so uh, maybe that's mm-hmm. where and even even that, that kind of bit of that pastoral sort of idea with Australia and New Zealand, when you know, they've got the bush poetry in Australia and then you've got this sort of obsession with um, New Zealand landscape and New Zealand, you know, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if the shock is that real. You know, everyone kind of talks about my work having a shock value, but I haven't really met many people that are actually genuinely shocked, so it might just be one of those like <laughs> weird buzzwords that people use to try and like sell <laughs> articles and interviews and things. Right. I'm pretty sure that most of the people who read my book are, who are of the older generation have seen and done much worse in their lives, right. you know? Yeah, right. From university to getting the book published, how did that come about? So I wrote my book and uh, my manuscript that I had when I finished my MA, I got offered to publish it and I decided that it wasn't, I didn't think it was ready, like I wanted a bit more time to kind of sit with it because I was still quite new to poetry at that stage, even after I'd just done my MA. Um, one year really focused on that project? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And I'd done writing courses before that, but I kind of, I think I just got into the stride of what I wanted to do at the very end of my MA year. So I wanted a bit more time to kind of go down that route before I, you know, because you can never take your first book back. Mm. And so I moved to Dunedin <laughs> with <laughs> my partner at the time and watched a lot of Judge Judy for three years (laughs) and my publisher Fergus Barrowman who's lovely and who runs um, Victoria University Press who was the person who offered me the publication in the first place would email me once every year just after Christmas and say (laughs) "Uh, so you're going to hand your book on at any point soon (laughs) and I'd always be like oh maybe give me another year and eventually after five years I got so embarrassed of having said no for so long I was like right I'm going to fucking I'm going to sit down and I'm going to sort this out. Mm. But over those five years, I had accumulated kind of enough disparate pieces of work to feel like finishing it was a manageable goal. Mm. You know, I felt like I was getting... It took me a long time, but, but I kind of like working slowly. I don't mm. I don't think... I think that there's a lot of p- pressure for people to put out their first book very quickly. Yeah. And I don't think that it's always good or helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and are there any poems in there that you think, oh, I just... Something a bit weird about them, or you know, ones that are sort of, if you had to rank them, ones mm. that would be sort of towards the bottom of ones that you enjoy. Well, the ones that I kind of enjoy the most are often the ones that people, <laughs> the audience doesn't like. Oh, really? So I don't, I don't think I would take anything back. But like, um, the the ones of mine that got quite famous when I, you know, the ones that people kind of like mention the most when they talk about me as like Keats is dead and mm. Monica, and neither mm. of which, you know, both of which are like. I, 
you know, I like and I wouldn't take out of the box, but they definitely mm. weren't my favourites. But I think that maybe... Was there anything on the cutting floor with Fergus? Was there anything that said that went onto the cutting floor and didn't make it in that you actually could thought was quite good? Or no, I mean, I mean, uh, everything that I wrote in those five years basically went into that book. Mm. Um, and nothing I did in my MA year went in. So I scrapped really? my whole first book. Really? And wow. wrote an entirely new one. Oh, right. Um, but I t- it took me... Because I work really kind of slowly and meticulously usually, although I've had to change, I've had to change the way I work a bit recently because I have I've had more commissions and stuff, and so I have to mm. be a bit more kind of on the ball. Mm. When you say commissions, so what kind of thing? So I did something for the Hamilton Gardens just this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I did something for the Cindy Sherman exhibition in Wellington. Um, I'm doing something for the Auckland Museum. That's cool. Uh, yeah. And so are they predominantly spoken pieces so you actually have to perform them or are they written or printed or...? Well, they were all designed to be spoken, um, but then that instance the Cindy Sherman one then got published in like a pamphlet with, um, that the City Gallery put out, mm. so I don't know, yeah. Was that one, was it expressed, was it, it um, sort of... Yeah, talking about the work. It was about one that oh. it was like a whole bunch of writers in Wellington were asked to respond to a particular like a work of their choosing. That's so cool. like Pip Adam, I don't know if you know Pip Adam, but she's fantastic and she did a cool one. And um, mm. the what the, the when I did it, um, Yvonne Todd, who's one of my favourite photographers, came and did one. And cool. Yeah. And and the piece, the artwork that you were responding to, what was what was it of? Like what was it? Um, it was kind of one of her weird eighties ones where she was like, it's like a. Like a real Jerry Springer version of a Sweet Valley High cover, like if someone left kind of high school and you know, it's it's the the, the photos are kind of like like weird glamour shots, but there's always something a little bit off about them. So they're kind of like it's like a blonde woman who's um in like a really frilly blue blouse, clutching a <laughs> teddy bear and looking really sadly into the middle distance. It's called it's it's called Untitled Four O Four because she doesn't. <laughs> She lets the public like title her work by consensus or whatever. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. And it, had you heard, did you know her work before or? Nah, not really. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not. I don't mm. know. Um, I'm not very familiar with the art scene. Mm. But um, it must be cool to be yeah, be getting commissions and. But in terms of spoken word, do you what do you think about spoken word and um, quotation marks? What do I think about it? Yeah. What are your thoughts on <laughs> spoken word? No. Are you in a camp? Like you know how there's some people that's like, no, I'm a page poet. No, I'm a spoken word artist. Oh well, I kind of like you know, like I'm not a perf- <laughs> I, like I wouldn't consider myself a performance poet. Like I. Yeah. But um, perform? Do you do you feel like you don't perform your poems? You you, you do a reading rather than a performance or? No, I kind of like I do kind of perform a little bit, but I, like as you say, it's kind of uh, to quote my friend Karen Das, dry balls. <laughs> you know, like it's like I like my to me the funniest kind of performance is like a really um non-emotive one like I like I find that funny yeah um and so that's kind of what I've chosen to do but they definitely like as an element of love performance and timing and stuff that I do think about when I read mm. um but I, I write things kind of first and foremost to be read on the page and I think that's mm. it's it's not like a it's not because I'm in any, any particular camp or like because I have any strong feelings either way like I think both are really good and legitimate forms of poetry it's just that like I prefer to stay at home and read people's books you know <laughs> rather than yeah. you know like I'm not someone who kind of goes out to hear performance poetry very or often you're not a slam slammer no although I, I have to say like I kind of don't always understand what the difference is between the two right yeah yeah I, my poetry history is not very good oh, um, oh like your knowledge of yeah, like I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the difference between performance and slam was, and I couldn't tell you what Siegfried Sassoon was doing or where he lived, or yeah. yeah. Well, I guess you know, at the end of the day, it's the the work that is you know, making a difference, and people are really kind of hooking into it and starting to pick up on it overseas, and mm. um, yeah. And because so I heard that so Lord retweeted something about your work at one point. Do you have do you know Lord or have you got a connection with her or do you like her, her work? Oh yeah, she's cool. I don't know her. Um I have met her a couple of times and mm. she's really lovely and um Because her mother is also a poet, Sonia Yellick. Yeah. And yeah. have you read do you know much about her work or? Yes, I really like her poetry. I don't know, like I've like I've met 
like her once or twice at like mm-hmm. kind of events or something. But do you, you know, think... I'm not calling her up on the phone every day being, hey, no. <laughs> do you think that um, when that you know with that retweet, do you think that it had a kind of an effect on? Oh yeah, lots of fake Lord fan bots follow me now. So lots of people pretending to be uh, Lord now follow my profile. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's really hard to, to tell. I think that because she, she just sent it, it was like a, rather than a retweet, it was like her sending me a message. So probably only people who followed both of us would ever have seen it anyway. Right. You know? I just want to ask you about censorship because, I mean, it's 2017, so they're obviously, you know, TV shows say a lot of bad words and that, but do you get censored, you know, on the radio and things like that? Do you get censored or... No, or when, I, when I read things? things on the radio, I try... <laughs> and make an effort to read the poetry that doesn't have kind of curse words in it. Mm. Not not because I think that, like, you know, the New Zealand public can't handle it, but, you know, like, it's, you know, I think I just, it's part of their broadcasting Standard policy, and, things, yeah. and I think it's, res- you know, I like to be respectful of that. Right. I don't, yeah. Yeah, and, and when, when you had your editing process with Fergus, like, cause are, are there a lot of poetry books under their wing that are, uh, you know, do you have F-bombs and things? Is it, is it a common thing or not? Are you sort of a bit different in that respect? I think that uh, maybe for New Zealand poetry there isn't a lot of kind of... I mean, there's Jeff Cochran who's fantastic and who... Mm. I, don't know, I can't remember if he has a lot of, like, filthy stuff in his poems or not, but mm. if you ever hear him talk in person. <laughs> no, I think that... But they, they, they certainly are, like really willing to publish kind of stuff that's a bit more out there and even mm. if their poetry isn't like that it's not because they're not accepting poetry like that I think that's just more um, kind of indicative of the writing culture here mm. but certainly they have like short story <laughs> collections and mm. um, novels which kind of push push boundaries and uh, they definitely like there was nothing in there that they wanted censored in fact there were some things where I was like maybe I should take that out and Fergus was like no you have to keep it in really yeah wow that's interesting isn't it because I mean in terms of the editing process so a lot of what you put in they didn't they weren't too heavy-handed with the editing they barely edited anything at all wow. actually they were really that's I think cool. that it, I think that I had gone over it so mm. much that yeah. um the there wasn't kind of a lot of huge stuff and mm. I did there was a bunch of stuff that I changed um Ashley Young was my editor and she was fantastic and she has a really good eye and she made a heap, heaps of really useful suggestions all of which I immediately took <laughs> the only thing the only suggestions that I didn't take were Fergus's suggestions on consistent punctuation <laughs> which I you know and capitalization like I'll have yeah. ampersands and ends in a poem which I know drives everyone out the wall but yeah. I, I just think that it's kind of a, my 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 feeling about it is that it's a generational thing and I'd prefer to go with like the the grammar that's the most emotive rather than having a, a kind of standardized grammar so yeah. we that was the only thing you that we had you. to negotiate you on. Grammar rebel you. Yeah, grammar rebel, yeah. <laughs> I'm not E.E. E. Cummings, don't worry. <laughs> well, you talk a bit about surreal, you know, sur- you know, love of surreal things. So in your next project that you're going to do, what direction do you want to take? I'm going to do exactly the same thing again. <laughs> because I kind of believe there's a... Winning formula. Well, I, I, like I, I know I have posted this kind of essay before and not everyone has agreed with it and there's been some really kind of good to valid criticisms of it but I, I there's this essay I really love by a poet called Dorothy Alasky who is one of my other favourite poets mm-hmm. um, from the States and she wrote a book called Poetry is Not a Project and I think that there are really like there are books of poetry that I really love that are kind of project based you know someone will be like I have this like idea and I want to follow this path and in fact one of my favourite books of New Zealand poetry is um, Gregory Kahn's This Paper Boat, which is, I, I suppose you could technically mm. call like a, that, that there are er- elements of, you know, he's like, he's really thought about how to put the narrative and together and tie all of the disparate streams together. Mm. But the way that I always want to write and the way that kind of makes me excited to write is not to, is just to kind of write from where I am every day because otherwise, you know, like I've tried, like I have tried to do other kind of projects before and it just kind of doesn't like work for me you mean, writing yeah you know like I tried to do mm. like a really serious like book of non non like like a you know like a really moving and like evocative <laughs> non-fiction book and it just like drove me crazy <laughs> I just lo- like lost my mind um 
it on Brew Brew Town, so the application mm. that he created. So um, I heard you say that you've used that before for your work. So uh, I use it all the that. time. Every single poem I have in that book has really? has been through that app. Wow. That, yeah, thing. It's, um, it sounds like it's pretty cool. It's really cool. He is a genius. And I love him. And he has this beautiful thing. He, he, he invented... Um, well, I mean, the cut-up technique has been around since Burroughs and probably before, like all of the surrealists mm. use it. But he, I think... He's, I looked for years, because we met years ago in a poetry class, and we were both really interested in kind of kind of randomization techniques and borrowing things and stealing things. It's a bit and Bowie. Like, it's a bit Bowie, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's just kind of the most exciting way to write, because otherwise you're just relying on your own internal monologue all the time, and I think that it's really helpful to play. I think that it's like... Yeah, I think it's like really generative and and useful mm. and exciting. Interesting. And I think that, um, you know, like it it's it's as much creative work to kind of use those processes as it is to sit down with a blank page. It just kind of I don't know. It just kind of opens up new new ways to to use language for me. Mm. Um, and he built this <coughs> amazing machine that kind of does randomization. So you put a block of text in. You know you. Take it. You like take a page from Margaret Atwood, and you can, it'll randomize the words, or you can swap all the nouns with a different person. So what we used to do is, um, we actually swapped our books with each other. So we put the whole text of this paper boat in with my entire book, and we swapped our nouns over. It's like we just like have a blast When's that reading. Book coming it. Out? Ah, you can have it. That sounds great. You can have it. I love both of those books. Yeah, we just kind of, you know, have a glass of gin together and read like lines from our weird hybrid poetry <laughs> book and it's just it's, it's like funny and surprising and like we did it with Sylvia Plath and um Frank O'Hara really? as well so you can do these mashups so you, yeah, yeah totally because Frank O'Hara was always my hero and Sylvia Plath was like Greg's teen hero so we kind of put our heroes <laughs> together and, and and it's really it's, it's, it's the difference is staggering as well if you like swap the nouns around if you put yeah. Sylvia Plath's nouns into Frank O'Hara it makes Frank <laughs> O'Hara really fucking depressing really? but like if you put Frank O'Hara's nouns into Sylvia Plath like it cheers her poetry up so much <laughs> and it, I don't That's know hilarious. it's just kind of like a really fun it's and a fun Should we do a plug? So what's the app called? So um, it's called Glass Leaves. It has like 20 functions. Awesome. And just for, you know, as you say, generating ideas and sometimes if you get stuck, just being able to play around with the words a bit and have fun. and Even just to make myself, like I use it just to make myself laugh. Like I have a <laughs> list of nouns because kind of what I do is I, I noun mine. So if yeah. like I take all of like Chelsea Minnes, like... Kimmy Walters, Mark Leidner, Adrian Rich, Frank O'Hara, I strip their nouns out and that's a function that the text manipulator can do mm. as well. Like it can take all of the nouns and separate them or it can take all of the adjectives and separate them and then you have this amazing word list to work with. And I just randomise the nouns and then I put my own ones in there. So I'll, I'll, I'll you know, like I'll just be reading through these like pages and pages of nonsense. <laughs> but it, you'll come across like a phrase like tall werewolf sobbing in a wheelie bin, you know, and it'll just like make, you know, I'll just be at home in my room, like having a quiet giggle for three minutes. Love it. Yeah. That's great. Oh, well, thank you so much, Kira. I feel like the listeners will really enjoy that little chat, um, as I have. <laughs>